It's October 2021, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm your host, Andy, bringing you yet another episode of the people, programs, and projects that you've come to know and love here in the Norfolk, Virginia area. So when we when we record these episodes, we try to find a, a link between the different segments. And this month, it just seemed like that link, the theme, really stood out because it's hard not to acknowledge that we're still in the middle of a pandemic and it still is affecting us every day. But as opposed to being in a kind of reactive stage and what do we do, it seems like we're all trying to find balance. And balance is a really key part of our work here at the Norfolk District and with the Army Corps because a work-life balance, balancing the workload with our partners, it's a theme that runs through everything we do. So this month for our programs portion, we're gonna bring you our regulatory program and you're gonna see how we try to balance the needs um, of the planet, needs of the environment with the the needs for um, industrial growth and and growth of people and, and locations. For our people segment, we're going to meet our new Equal Employment Opportunity Chief, Ms. Anna Myers, get to know her a little bit and see how she balances what employees need and what the Corps of Engineers needs. And our final segment for this episode is going to be one of our military construction projects at Joint Base Langley Eustis. And in this segment, you'll see how we balance our roles with our partners to help deliver the project to our customer. So now we're going to kick off this episode, It's All About Balance, Baby, with Jennifer Serafin, Chief of the Western Section of the Regulatory Office, and Terry Crockett Augustine, who's working hard up there in the Northern Section of the Regulatory Office. How would you explain to someone with no background what the Norfolk District Regulatory Office and the program, the regulatory program does? The regulatory program in in general across the nation. So there are are three primary federal laws that we operate under. One is the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. The other one is the Clean Water Act. It's specific to Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. And um, the Marine Protection, Terry... (laughs) Oh, I know it's section 103. Yeah, section 103 of the Marine Protection and Sanctuaries Sanctuary. Act. We may have to dub that over to get in there. Um, the primary ones that we deal with most often, you know, are uh, section 404, the Clean Water Act, which which regulates a discharge of dredged or fill material into a water of the United States. Essentially, what that entails would be if someone wants to build a driveway and they need to cross a wetland or a creek and they need to put a piece of pipe in the in the ground then they're 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 going to need a permit from the the department of army in order to do that if that that creek is a water of the united states and for for those projects that are in a what is considered a navigable water as as defined by congress pursuant to the rivers and harbors act so activities that occur under, over, or through those water bodies also require a a permit from the Department of Army, the regulatory branch in order. That would be like the piers, docks, boat lifts, dredging. If I'm a citizen of, let's say, like Virginia Beach, which which I am, let's um, (laughs) let's just say. So when would I, what would be something um, that I would be reaching out to you guys about? If you have wetlands on your property or a stream on your property, even if you think you may have it, you want to reach out to us to come out to your property and look at it to see whether or not you have wetlands or streams and whether or not you would need a permit for the activity that you may want to do on your property. It, it's, is it only if I wanted to build on that or should I like if I think I have wetlands or should I ask Rick to come out to assess it? Either way, a lot of people... Uh, have you come out to assess it, even if they're not building, because they want to know where the wetlands or streams are on their property. Good to know what you got. So that's on like the the per, the person level. What about like you guys? Um, 
you do with larger businesses and corporations too. So what kind of stuff do those larger entities reach out to you about and for? Well, so uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation and Federal Highways, they're by far probably one of our biggest customers in the regulatory branch. I mean, and and because, you know, as they do these long range scope projects of, you know, interstate highways and bypasses and, you know, the, those all very much <laughs> involve the crossing of waters of the United States. So we work through, you know, just the initial scoping project, scoping processes with, with those entities and the same with like any of those major infrastructure type projects, very integrally related to what we do. And we, we work with other federal and state agencies in a joint processing. A lot of times with those projects, you know, if there is another age, another federal agency, that's the lead, like federal highways would be the lead or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission sometimes can be a lead federal agency and we will work in conjunction with them and other federal and state agencies to go through all of the processes to, to, that encompasses under the National Environmental Policy Act. Yes, and um, so a lot of um, data centers are coming into the areas, so they require the permits, um, solar farms, or something that, you know, we have a lot of um, permit for those. And I work a lot with the county because the counties have their own project. And so the counties are a very important entity that we work with. And that brings up a question. So I know like, so there's a, there's certain bodies of water that um, fall under you guys on the federal side. I guess with, with other smaller bodies of water or the non-navigable ones that fall under the, the counties and the localities, is that how it works? Oh, no. <laughs> um, the the definition of waters of the United States changes. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, it, 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 we are currently as of a few, few weeks ago, two weeks ago, we are now back to defining and identifying waters of the United States under pre-2015 criteria and definition because of court cases that have occurred under waters of the United States, su subsequent definitions of water of the United States since 2015 on a national level for those water bodies that, so this is another reason why, you know, for project managers, Corps of Engineers project managers to go out and look at a piece of property you know, whether it's at the request of the landowner or a potential buyer for, um, you know, maybe they want to, to, to construct a, a solar farm on a large, you know, thousand acre piece of property. They're going to work with a consultant. The consultant's going to contact us. They're going to do a delineation. Project managers like Terry, they're going to go out there. They're going to walk that property with um, those consultants and look at the lateral limits, the geographic limits of the wetland boundary stops and start. But then they're also going to use whatever definition of waters of the United States that we are operating under to determine whether or not that water body and size really doesn't have anything to do with it. The inherent of all of the definitions that we've ever had, as long as in the 20 years I worked for the Corps of Engineers, the link is always to a navigable water of the United States. It doesn't have to be a navigable water in order for it to be subject to the Clean Water Act. Those that make that final determination is no, it, it does not. It is not a water in the United States. The states typically are the ones that will step in. And the Commonwealth of Virginia has a Department of Environmental Quality that they have their own permitting processes in place should there be potential impacts to those waters of the state. Okay. <laughs> so just even defining where, where, what you guys, that's a process in itself. Like is, does this fall under us? And, and if so, how, and then, so folks, it would be beneficial for them what I'm getting and, and correct me if I'm wrong to, if they're not sure either contact and you're a Virginia resident to contact the core to come out and check it out or Virginia department of uh, environmental quality. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what we'll do is I'll actually put some contact information in the show notes so folks can, <laughs> you guys can get more calls even um, than you already get. 
<laughs> call Terry. <laughs> no, actually, call Tucker Smith. Let's put okay. Tucker's number up there. Okay. Just <laughs> might do that. So, and now there's so so you're in the part where there's there's a protocol for defining what bodies of water and area you guys work with. Now, but there's also uh, um why should like the average Joe, Mr. Public or Miss Public care? Well, I think it's um, important because our mission is to protect the nation's aquatic resources while allowing for reasonable development. So it's important that they contact us to see whether or not there are any wetlands or streams on their property before impacting those areas. So it's making sure that you you know you the due diligence, I guess, of the environmental stewardship balancing that with as we continue to grow and yeah i i mean that's and i think terry nailed it i mean it is you know that is part of what we're tasked with doing is, is the protection of the aquatic resources and but while balancing that with development and and if someone wants to build a garage in their backyard and it's going to impact you know a forested wetland i mean that is a bit that is a consideration we're not here to say no you can't have your garage so we may talk to you about well you got this little bit of high ground over here how about building it over here and then we'll talk to that individual or those folks about like look here's what this forested wetland does and it's it's you know it provides obviously habitat for critters and you know it but it also provides for maybe what a lot of times is very meaningful for folks especially right now what we're seeing is is flooding impacts yeah. so that forested wetland could be running alongside a major tributary and it acts as as a major source for floodwater attenuation. So, you know, as part of a, a log, long and, and broad span of floodplain management, that's very important because as we start to pave over <laughs> all of these wetlands, there's nowhere for the water to go anymore. And so it just starts getting sh shunted downstream. And so just just like anybody else is like if somebody's paving over or damming up a stream or something above me that's going to have ramifications for me downstream we, we try to be very easy and reasonable to work with that's what we're tasked to do but we also work with folks to and and ed, and help educate the importance of the aquatic resource yeah yeah go ahead so it, no this is bigger than just your garage like this is you know this right. is this is this is you know state commonwealth national impact kind of stuff and and well, I guess the, the average community person is like, might not think about it like that. You guys are the ones out there thinking about that, the, the big picture all the time. Now, speaking of that big picture, you know, being a, being a federal agency, um, you know, how much, uh, how much, and you said, you're, you know, you're trying to help folks and how much wiggle room do you get with the different laws and instructions um, and acts that, that you're working with? I mean, is there a lot of wiggle room here or is it pretty cut and dry what uh, you can and cannot bless off and be and, and okay as far as projects go? I would say that it's pretty cut and dry. I mean, there's, there's flexibility like there is no flexibility on either it is like a water in the United States or it's not, you know, it, it, it is either, um, you know, your activity is regulated or it's not. But I think the flexibility comes in, in the different types of permitting processes that we have. So, you know, we have, we have a slew of a host of 50 some nationwide permits and those are authorizations that we have for minor impacts to waters of the united states so the little garage that might impact less than a tenth of an acre of wetlands and and so you know the the flexibility is talking is with talking to them and and helping them understand and reduce their impacts so that they may qualify their project, they could get it into the realm of something that is easy, more easily permitted um, under one of those nationwide per permits. But the 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 you know the the regulations related to the Endangered Species Act, which our permits have to comply with those, the National Historic Preservation Act, our permits have to you know anything we authorize has to comply with all those. So there's you know. Well, it's not. It's not just like the Norfolk District Regulatory right Office opinion. Like there, this there's a there's a protocol. There's a book. There's a there's a, a cross referencing. 
you know, right. There are it, so. there are a lot of regulations that yeah. that go behind the decisions that we make. And it's not just the Clean Water Act. It's not just the Rivers and Harbors Act. It is the Endangered Species Act. It is it is the National Environmental Policy Act. So there's there's a host of it that goes into a, a permit decision. So if I'm a if I'm reaching out to you to you guys for help on um, a piece of property I want to build on, what advice would you give me as the homeowner, as the one wanting to build? Like, what can I do? to make the process easier for everybody? I would say call us first so that we can have what we call a pre-app meeting with you that we can talk about what's there and how you can avoid and minimize your impacts so that, as Jennifer said, you may qualify for one of our minor um, impact permits. So step one is call. Yeah. I mean, certainly call before you do any work. Oh, yes. yeah. Yes. I mean, it is, it is. Yeah. That's yeah. We would rather hear from you beforehand than your neighbor call and rat you out for doing something. And then we got to go out there and, and investigate an unauthorized, an alleged unauthorized activity. Now we'd rather have the upfront conversations first, but I think too, one of the big messagings to the public too, and, and, and t I'm sure Terry can attest to this is how busy the regulators are right now. I mean, it's the workload is is tremendous. So I would encourage somebody that is interested in, in doing work and they're not really sure and maybe they have a contractor that they're working with. And we certainly encourage those folks to reach out to the um, the environmental consultants and the engineering communities that are out there, the private sector that may help them through that process. Yeah. On average, you know, and uh, for the project managers in the Norfolk district, they're running anywhere from 30 to 60 projects at any given time. And, you know, this is, and they're, they cover a large geographical areas, very, very busy. They're handling lots of phone calls. So I think, to, to, to help the, the public to understand is that, you know, yeah, you can give Terry a call and, you know, get on her calendar, but it may be three, four months before she can get out there and look at it just because she's got everybody else that she talked to three months ago. And so that if you can, and you have the means and the resources to contact, you know, an environmental consultant and kind of help initiate you know, get them to help you initiate and work through some of the, the background work. I said, if you don't have the means and the resources to do that, just understand that it's going to take us a little bit of time before we can get back to you. And then, you know, it's sort of like that manage the expectations for everybody because we do that with everything, whether it's working with a, a big developer or the mom and pop is, is you know, our project managers, I, you know, do a great job of, of helping to manage the expectations. Like, look, yep, I'm your project manager. I got your permit application today and I'm going to work through it in the next, you know, 30 to 60 days. And, and but understand that, you know, I don't have it within the capacity that I'm going to be able to turn this decision around in a week. Yeah, I want I'm going to go over it because I'm going to go over these steps. So the person who wants to build first, give, give, give them a call. Give, a, give the core vendors a call. Just put the call out there because step two is be patient. So call. Step three, if you have the means, try to engage with a private uh, environmental consultant. Step four is also be patient. <laughs> step five. <laughs> so step five, is there anything um, I can do in the meantime? Is there information to gather that could help you when you, you are able to come out? Or Yes, send as much information as possible. You can send photos um, of the area um, and any other information in there, but photos are really good. Some people even have sent in videos of areas, which yeah. helps. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point, Terry. Yeah, because the, the project managers can make determinations potentially just from their desktop. You know, if you've a smaller piece of property and it, it be like, yeah, that's a no brainer. It's a completely all uplands. And yeah, that is a definite possibility. I would say for, you know, what a, what a landowner or a potential, you know, project proponent could also do in the meantime is educate themselves too on the program. Um, our website, is a great tool for if even if you have the conversation with the project manager and 
talking about the potential project and the project manager throws out the terminology of, you know, well, your project might qualify for nationwide permit 13 for stream bank stabilization. And we can provide you with that link. And then you, you, you get to realize so that you know up front what kind of what you're getting yourself into and, and, you know, cause there is a responsibility as a permittee that you have to adhere to all these terms and conditions. So there you're applying for something that's very important and very meaningful, and it has long-term ramifications and con- and consequences if you don't stick to the terms and conditions and comply with the terms and conditions of a permit. Yeah. Like, a, like being, you gotta be an informed consumer. You got it, you know. Oh, you, that's you, a, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So here's what I have. Uh, this is the list I'm going with. <laughs> Number one, call the Corps of Engineers. Um, just make that that first that first effort. Just reach out. Um, because number two, you're gonna have to be be patient. Number three, we're if you can, you have the means, you're gonna en- engage with an environmental consultant if you can. Number four, continue to be patient. Um, number five, gather your photos and your videos of this area, and then make sure you, you know, send them to that regulatory, um, special that you're working with. And the last thing I have is while you're waiting, educate yourself because it will help the process in the long run for both, you know, the, the permitter and the permittee. So does that, is there anything else for number seven, or do you think we covered it? I mean, don't, I would say, don't be afraid to ask questions, but also when, when we ask for additional information or upfront information is to try, what we're trying to do is to, is to get you to be very clear and concise in what your project is. And, you know, it may be that we need, you know, better drawings of, of what you're doing or perhaps the reasons why you want to do what you want to do. So it's, it's, it's very much having that conversation with, you know, your project manager and, and so that we can, at the end of the day, get to that permit decision as, as, as quickly as we can. So it's, it's on the permit to, to, to work with their regulator and be proactive, keep that conversation going, supply you guys with the information that you need. It's not that you're trying to be a pain in the butt. It just, you need that clarity in order to give the uh, person what they're what they're looking for or hoping for. Is that what I'm? Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. So, what what's the best way for me to reach you guys? If as as a member of the public, do you guys is or e- is email the best? Is phone call is what is the best route? I think email is the best. But if you need to talk to us, you can always call. Yeah, we, um, I, and that may vary a little bit by project manager, and it could also yeah. vary at, at, on any given month, um, too. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know there are some project managers that would probably just, they're happy with the, the phone call. You know, back in the day, we would get walk-ins to our our offices, but that's that's almost a complete thing of the past now, especially during the pandemic. So we're doing so much remote. And so, you know, and on our website and, you know, you know, this our you know, project managers, you know, the section project managers, there's links to their emails, there's phone numbers um, for the sections for each of the north, south, east, west and special project sections for the Norfolk district, the regulatory branch. So, yeah, I I think a lot of times that may be the a good initiation to especially if you're not sure who you want, who you need to talk to. I think an interesting taking away, takeaway of, of talking about this is that um, having this isn't an, an automaton doing this work that you guys do. This isn't like a, a machine that that does like I mean, you you are human beings who are going to these regulations who are who are working this for your customers and for the community. And so kind of keeping that in mind um, that some, at, you know, like you said, some folks prefer email, some folks prefer phone and that, you know, there's a each regulator has a different way, you know, um, that they like to communicate with their folks and, and operate. So having folks keep that in mind that, you know, it's not a one size, well, the regulations are standard, the, yeah. the personal part of it is not a one size fits all kind of thing. Um, but I, I do want to add though, but on that token, we do understand that there are a lot of communities. There are folks out there that, that don't utilize technology in their communications right. and and you know that's very much do recognize that too and there are just, you know 
people that I'm not going to have an email address. I will never have an email address. And, you know, and those, you know, we will still talk with you. We still want to talk with you. We don't want to use technology as a means to hide behind. That's not what it's for. It's, it's, it's very much if, how best do you communicate to? And I really want to express that, you know, the project managers are, they work really hard at what they're doing and, and providing that customer service, I think is very important to all of the regulators. Terry, do you, I, I, yeah. I see you as, yeah. I mean, as, as um, one of our top notch ones that are out there providing that customer service in a very, very busy area. Yes. I would, I, cause it's been saying that regulatory is the face of the core. And that is true because we interact with the public daily, whether it's by phone, email, meetings or even you know on site visits face to face so and i think like jennifer said calling is very important because a lot of times when you talk to someone you can get more information than just an email so you know for the regulators for all the work that they have to do they also you know they have they have to have that that innate ability to provide stellar customer service but they also have to have thick skins and an open mind and the, and they do a great job at it and it's it's not an easy it's not an easy job for sure but we we take what we do very seriously and and that we do want to provide that communication on the decisions that we do make and that we are forced to make not forced to make but we you know we're tasked with making and i think being part of the corps of engineers resonates with the project managers and that that it is a, a great organization to work for and to work with the other elements in the district. So keeping in stride with uh, our theme of balance, after talking with Jennifer and Terry, it seems like there needs to be a balance of efforts with folks in the community and folks in our regulatory office. And we need people in the community to, you know, reach out early, reach out often and have patience and you'll get you have the same back from our regulatory folks. We're rolling into segment two of our episode. It's all about balance, baby. Like I teased earlier in the episode, this is going to be with Miss Anna Myers, who just started with us as our new chief of the Equal Employment Opportunity Office. So this is a, a really cool chance to see how a former lawyer. I don't know if they function like Marines, where they're never not a lawyer, but they're a former lawyer. Um, where a former lawyer or ex-lawyer uh, joins us in a different kind of way, but takes that experience and that drive uh, with her to make sure that she's balancing the needs of the district and of the Army Corps with the needs of each individual that works with and for us. My adult background, I've been a, was a litigator for 22 years, a uh, practicing attorney in private practice and, and really on the hustle. And um, in 2019, kind of the world was falling apart. My whole world was falling apart. And I decided I had worked with families, at-risk families in Norfolk for 20 years. I worked with uh, child abuse and neglect. I worked with um, the foster care system. I worked with uh, lots of domestic violence, lots of family abuse, lots of just hard custody disputes, people really fighting over their most, most precious asset, their children. And I needed a major change in my life. So I went to work for the Navy Exchange in their EEO office, running the disability program over there. Loved it. I always still wanted to be a helper and I wanted to be a creative problem solver. And that is really what I think our some of my biggest assets is that creative problem solving and I want to help in any way that I can. And I'll bend over backwards to try to help people to be able to do their jobs and to do them well. I want everyone in my organization, everyone in the agency to be successful, to meet the, the, the mission, whatever I can do to, to assist. I want to be there for them. Like what kind of stuff when you were working with the Navy, what kind of stuff did you do when you were with them? Uh, in running the disability program, I recruited persons with disabilities. I worked in the reasonable accommodations arena. So I was assisting people. So the Navy Exchange, as you know, is a retail organization. And so 
we had people that worked in as cashiers, people that worked as janitors, people that worked in warehouses, people and executive people. So I, it was the gamut. I, if you, did, do you need a chair to sit at the, at the cashiers uh, at, at your station? Do you need a, additional breaks? Are you diabetic and you need some, some breaks from the floors? And do we need to bring someone else in to cover your break? That sort of thing. All the way to our, our folks at headquarters. Do you need... Are you suffering from carpal tunnel because you've been doing this for 20 years or 10 years or, or whatever, and you need uh, dictation software? Do you need ergonomic setup? We, I worked closely with the safety folks to do ergonomic assessments and then help people. Worked extensively with the CAP program, the Computer and Electronic Assistance Program th through the DOD. They support the Army as well, of course, um, provide electronic assistance to, to folks who, who need it. That was really a big, big accomplishment, and, and I was happy to be there and, and work on, on that, kind of, that kind of positive change. I talked with the regulatory folks earlier this month, and I wanted to see if kind of what you're doing in the EEO world is similar to theirs in that it seems like it's really a balance between this is the protocol, right? This is like the instruction. And then there's the personal part. So yes, we're trying to balance like making sure we follow the directives and the instructions, but also do it in a way that doesn't lose a personal side of it. Well, certainly we, the, the whole point of reasonable accommodations for sure is we are going to bend a policy to make sure that you can do your job successfully. We don't eliminate the functions of your job. We help you to do your job better, or we help you to do your job um, in a way that, that meets the needs of a person with a disability. So if we need to restructure things and look at things differently so that you can achieve the same, the same goal, achieve the mission, then that's what we want to do. We want to welcome that because studies far and wide have shown that the more diverse population that we have, the better the organization, the more ideas coming from different perspectives really assist in um, in developing a, a quality agency and uh, just help to meet our mission in a, in a, in, in a better way. We, more ideas is always better. And something about just being like decent humans to other humans. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. Oh, that is first and foremost, be a good human. Right. And I feel like, you know, once you kind of do that, then you can, you know, the mission kind of, you know, when you, once you are decent to people and give people a chance to, to do their job and to work well and to work with others, you know, let we have to learn to work with others. I mean, my teenage daughter teaches me on a daily basis about new thoughts, new how people should interact and how changing times, how we change culturally. And I, and I want to embrace that. And I, I welcome the opportunity to train people uh, with regard to that. There is a wonderful program through um, State Vocational, teaches people uh, to change their mindset, to develop and grow in their mindset about how we approach people with disabilities, how we approach minorities, how we approach people from different backgrounds than, than what we have. We sit here as as one per female, white, uh, forty nine. You know, and so all of that bring, carries all of our bias, all of our unconscious bias with us. And so I think it's a constant effort to to retrain, to retrain our thinking, to re, re retrain where we are as a society and what's what's acceptable behavior, what's civil behavior to one another. Mm -hmm. We don't have to like everyone that we work with, but we do have to be behave in a way that's w with some civility and with um, uh, some regard for our fellow human. You know, and I think um, in the last uh, couple of years, and we've seen different movements come about and, and the term inclusion, that's what I think has been interesting is, is really taking a look at inclusion what does that look like to be a truly inclusive um, enterprise? First and foremost, an inclusive enterprise deals fairly and consistently with, with people, recognizing that we all come from different backgrounds. My experience is not your experience. And having some acceptance of where we all come from. I think having an openness to uh, learning about our our coworkers learning about the people that we're around on a daily basis helps us. Understanding helps to create that uh, inclusiveness that that we we should desire. It's a goal. 
for certainly for federal agencies. And we need to pay more than just lip service to it. We need to really get in and, and work and and try to understand one another and with acceptance and um, fairness and consistency. And that open mind that you were talking about earlier, that's tough yeah. sometimes when you don't, you don't realize those unconscious biases and, and, and words that we hear, but when you, when you catch yourself in one of those, you're like, oh crap, like. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, it? and it happens, we colloquialisms that we, that we use that we just need to eliminate from our vocabulary because times have changed. It is not acceptable to, to use certain old, you know, familiar, the things we heard our grandmother say that go, make you go, oh. <laughs> yeah, that like pain your soul when you realize yeah. it, you know, it's like, gosh. Yes, I, I agreed. And I think it's important that folks who work with us should say to us, here's my reality. And that helps with the inclusion that we're talking about. Um, I think that the understanding and the being willing to have difficult conversations, that that's not an appropriate thing for you to say or do, or I have these concerns and you've never had, you really do have privilege. And I used to say to people, I grew up with nothing. I grew up in a little small town in Western Virginia and we struggled all the time. I certainly understand, you know, being poor and um, it's nothing. It is, there is no, still no comparison in the, the, the privilege that I still had. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. So like, how do we take this? How, where do we, where do you like, let's, let's take it to like the Norfolk district. What can I do right now that you think would help me help the Norfolk district? Get involved with the, with the programs that are put out. Uh, Shariko is working. Shariko Wanamaker is working on programs for the, the disability month. We're working closely on those kinds of things. Participate, meet other people, make an effort to meet people who don't, don't look like you, think like you, talk like you. I, I hope that others in the district would, would welcome uh, conversations with, with people they don't necessarily talk to every day. I think having an open dialogue is really important. I think developing a program that's consistent, that we put on something monthly, either centered around the, the federal observances or some other sort of theme that we decide to take up. We have a lot of observances, a lot of opportunities to really hopefully have some some of the folks who do really understand to step forward and, mm -hmm. and provide education. I think it's a constant education. I say, I've said it over and over again. I say it in, in, again and again, that success for all of us comes from passion, teamwork, and a growth mindset. And we really have to con consider getting out of whatever stuck mindsets we, we have and welcoming the opportunity to, to grow. So, and I, I like what you said, and I'm going to, I'm going to repeat it. You said success comes from passion, teamwork, and a growth mindset that I think right there really sums up um, a good, uh, uh, stepping stone for all of us to uh to go from here so that just that alone was that's stellar well i, I stole it i i certainly am i'm in am a reinvent not reinvent the wheel uh person that is from for for uh all the the plagiarism concerns that is from uh growth the growth mindset by carol dweck so <laughs> Uh, but I internalized that book. I recommend re recommend it to everyone. So what do you think about the Norfolk District so far? And what are you excited about? What, what impresses you? The projects are amazing. I am so impressed by what the Corps of Engineers does here. When, when On orientation day, when I came in, it was the week of Ida and the um, Afghan refugees uh, coming in. And so everyone was busy and really just working furiously to make sure that we accommodate uh, people who have suffered um, tremendously, uh, either through natural disaster or, or coming from Afghanistan. Uh, to me, it was mind blowing to walk into an organization that was able to pick up so quickly and um, organize an effort to, to, to really help. As I said before, it's always been my passion to be a helper and, I'm also impressed by 
just all the people, everyone has been friendly and welcoming and willing to answer all of my questions, no matter how basic they are. And I really, I won't, I won't use the D or S word, but the very, very basic questions, <laughs> <laughs> like coming into any agency, all of the accesses and, and protocols and it has been a challenge. And mm -hmm. Yeah, that that teamwork, you know, is what we have. This we're in this we're in the city in Virginia, but yet we have a worldwide impact with what we're doing, and that teamwork definitely is what I believe that we're known for. The teamwork and the partnerships is how we make all of this awesome stuff happen. So, um, how could now what would be some of the so it's talking about our team? what would be some of the things that our teammates would reach out to you for in specific? And then we'll go into how they would do that. Okay. I want to talk to anyone who has any sort of workplace dispute. Let's talk about conflict at the low, lowest level. If you, if there is even an inkling in your mind that hey, this doesn't feel right, this isn't, I am struggling a little bit, come talk to me. Uh, we can, it doesn't have to be, oh, you're just negative. You're just complaints. Um, I want to talk to management before there's a problem with, with um, direct reports, or I don't, I don't even know exactly what you call them, but the downline um, folks, I want to, I, I want to talk to you before, before there's a problem or before there's a big problem, before it gets to the point that someone's coming into my office and saying, I want to file a complaint against this person. Let's, the, we have a lot of opportunity to to resolve disputes at a very low level, a conversation. Uh, um, how can we, how can we do things differently? Um, so there's that piece of it. Obviously I also, if there, if you're ever suffer anything uh, or you see anyone suffering any form of discrimination, hostile work environment, I, I want to know at, as soon as possible, uh, immediately um, notify your supervisor and, and, Hopefully your supervisor takes action, but I can also be involved in that conversation to help mediate, to help mitigate, to help de-escalate a situation before it gets out of control. Uh, additionally, if you are struggling to do anything in your job, I can't, I can't, I need the dictation software is a, just a good, but very simple example of, I, I'm just really struggling with, with wrist pain, or I'm struggling with arthritis, or I'm struggling with anything. I, and I need help. I need, or, or my back hurts after I come into the office. I haven't been in the office very much for a year and a half. And now I'm coming into the office all of the time and my chair isn't right. Come talk to me. Let's, let's make that right. Because if you are, if there's a negative, even if it's, if it's painful, if either emotionally or physically, then you're not going to be your best self to be able to be most successful at your job. And we want to make sure that people are, are, doing their very best to achieve the mission. Awesome. That now, yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how can, what are the best ways to get a hold of you? Uh, you can call me. Uh, my office number is 757-201-7054. I don't have a cell phone yet, but it will, um, it, it's on its way. It has shipped. <laughs> and email and come to my office. Ring if the door is closed. Ring the bell. I will certainly answer if um, I'm not in with a confidential meeting with someone else. Um, come in. Generally, we'll be in the office at least you know once a week for now. Mm -hmm. um, but and certainly, if someone says no, it calls me and says I really want to meet in person. No problem. And, oh you know, my and, and Again, sometimes. Well, and that's the truth. Sometimes people just need to vent. They just need to say it's a bad day. I don't like the way someone's speaking to me. I don't like the way that I'm being treated today. Let's talk about whether or not it does fall under, you know, something that's an issue or something that is, Hey, we're having a bad day and let's just talk it through. I'm okay. perfectly happy to have those kinds of conversations. So, so please, before you take yeah. it out on your, on your um, reports or your supervisor, then just take it out on me. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for not only coming to the Norfolk District and taking this position as, you know, the, the head of our EEO program, but also being an awesome human. Because that thank is, you. that is like, it's hard to put that on a resume, I know, but like, I, you know, it, it definitely shines through and I'm so excited to have you on the team. Thank and you. I'm excited, <laughs> I'm excited. I think that you will be back on the podcast 
multiple times, I feel. I hope so. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I'm thrilled to be at the Army Corps of Engineers in the Norfolk District and look forward to talking with you, talking with anybody who, who uh, wants to reach out. It doesn't always have to be with a problem. We are at part three of our program today. It's all about balance, baby. And this is going to be our project section. We um, recently had a groundbreaking with one of our uh, military partners over at Joint Base Langley Eustis. And one of our newest teammates met up with Colonel Hallberg over there and is showcasing how we balance our role with the role of our military partners. And here's an extra little bonus for y'all. Our new teammate, Mr. Jay Walker. That's right. Be jealous, the coolest thing ever. Mr. Jay Walker, uh, this is his premier encore talk. You're going to be hearing more from him in the future. He comes to us with a very cool broadcast background. So you're going to get to enjoy something a little bit different because we'll balance my style with Jay's style. All right. Part three, the project's portion of our program today on the episode it's all about balance baby i'm so excited not because i'm the commander with a front row seat for this event i'm excited for the air force for the capabilities that this project will deliver, and I'm excited to unlock the potential of the airmen who will get to work out of this facility. That was Colonel Eric Mack, commander of the 363rd ISR, or Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Wing, addressing leadership from the Air Force Civil Engineering Center, Air Combat Command, 633rd Air Base Wing, and Norfolk District's U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at a groundbreaking ceremony on Langley Air Force Base, 16 September 2021. After many years of hard work and four unofficial groundbreakings, I might add, we are finally delivering them the world-class facility that they need and deserve. I believe we all stand on the shoulders of giants and a military construction project of this magnitude is no simple feat to pull off. This day would not come to fruition if not for the hard work, endless hours, and true dedication from a large team of professionals. To them, I want to say thank you. During this ceremony, Attendees put shovels in the ground to commemorate the partnership in the construction of a new ISR targeting center. Colonel Brian Hallberg, commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Norfolk District, had this to say. It's important, especially in this case, because we're building readiness, right? We're building readiness for the Department of Defense. They support ISR missions around the globe. Right, so this is uh, going to provide them a state-of-the-art facility and where they're co-located and provides them the means to do their mission. Hampton Mayor Donnie Tuck and Vice Mayor Jimmy Gray were also present to show support for the collaboration towards improved combat effectiveness and the working conditions of the personnel who support the unit mission. You don't get anything done without having a great partner and uh, you know working with the stakeholders to accomplish their mission. Reporting from Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, I'm James Walker. After I hear one of Jay Walker's pieces, I just want him to narrate my life. So if you feel the same, let us know. Maybe you can get a hold of us um, on our socials. We are on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, you can head over to our website. Email us direct. Give us some more show ideas. Um, so that really closes out this month's program. I want to thank everybody for listening. You'll find all of your core talks on our YouTube channel, as well as, again, all of our socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'd like to thank the following folks who helped out for this episode. Jennifer Serafin, Terry Crockett-Augustine, Anna Myers, Jay Walker, and as always, our Commander Colonel Brian Hallberg, my boss, Mark Haviland, and all of you out there who help make us relevant. Until next time, this is Corey.